the European Union is set up with an institutional structure that brings about an ever closer union. And it's been the, the difficulty and the reluctance of, of British pro-Europeans even to accept that, which has often led to a dysfunctionality in, in our membership of the European Union, that we have thought that it was possible by an act of will um, to turn the European Union into something that it wasn't, uh, an intergovernmental trading agre agreement. Hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust. I'm talking once again to Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust, about developments in the UK, particularly relating to Brexit. Brendan, a rather melancholy mood seems to have settled over the debate about what the British government is going to do in its relationship with the EU. There is an increasing tendency from Labour commentary to suggest that we are where we are, we have to uh, lie on the bed we've made, uh, because the European Union in any event doesn't really want us back. And so therefore, uh, seeking a serious rejoin policy is really for the birds. Why is this tone emerged now, do you think? Well, I think there's a, an electoral calculation behind it and uh, an internal Labour calculation behind it. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of members of the Labour Party um, hoped very much that when Labour got into government, one of the ways in which it would differentiate itself from the Conservative Party was by a, a much more um, radically enthusiastic approach to the European Union. Uh, that certainly hasn't happened. And uh, in order to deal with uh, this uh, unhappiness, potential unhappiness within the party, um, the Labour Party leadership have um, evolved uh, uh, a two-pronged strategy, if you like, a two-pronged rhetoric and narrative, one of which is to say that there's a reset, reset of the relation with the European Union. Um, and that, of course, is a, a very movable feast. It's a very elastic concept. It'll take some time before it becomes clear how, how thin, gruel this is, the reset. Um, but the other half of the rhetoric is to say, well, anyway, the European Union don't want us. Uh, and that, of course, dispenses the, Uni the United Kingdom government uh, from uh, pursuing with any enthusiasm or, or any vim uh, um, the approach to, to rejoining the European Union. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, is reassuring, if you like, um, in a curious way to the remainers, the remaining remainers within the, you know, the within Labour, um, to be told um, we'd love to be able to to help, uh, but unfortunately the European Union don't want us back. Uh, there's also a, a, a possibility, of course, that this may morph into blaming the European Union. Stella Creasy at one stage remarked that it had taken us years to walk out of the European Union and it would take years for us to crawl back in, as she put it. Um, there may be an implication that people who um, want to rejoin the European Union are both unrealistic and, and also selling this country short um, because they're knocking on a door um, that is firmly closed shut to us. But is it actually true that the European Union doesn't want us back? Uh, at the moment, there's no desire in the United Kingdom um, uh, at an official and governmental level to rejoin the European Union. So obviously the European Union is not engaged with that question. Uh, it's a different question. How would they react um, if we uh, seriously and enthusiastically and on some basis of political stability were to approach the European Union uh, asking to go back? Um, and there, I think we would certainly, in, in the right circumstances, receive an encouraging response. That's not to say that it would be possible immediately to rejoin the European Union. Um, but the idea that uh, uh, a seriously pro-EU British government, um, which wanted to do the things necessary to become a member of the European Union, will be rejected out of hand by the European Union it is simply silly. When one talks to people in the European Union about uh, Britain's future potential uh, rejoining, one's very much struck by the, the, this lack of trust, the profound lack of trust that has been created by the whole Brexit process. And the blame for that at the moment lands very strongly on the Conservative Party. Uh, but do you feel that that might also be extended to the Labour Party in due course? I think it will be extended to the Labour Party, but, but it's not just a question of uh... Uh, how Boris Johnson and how Theresa May conducted the negotiations leading to Brexit. 
um, there's a, a further distrust, a more deeply embedded distrust in many quarters in continental Europe within the European Union um, for the United Kingdom, which um, spent all its time negotiating opt outs and um, special arrangements um, supposedly in order to, to make more solid and more reliable um, its membership of the European Union um, and then turned around and decided to walk out anyway. Um, now, that's not a, a petty minded distrust. Um, it's not a, a resentment um, in the same way as Boris Johnson generated in continental Europe. Um, but it is a, a, a question mark that people put to themselves. Um, would the United Kingdom ever be prepared um, to be a, a sincere and full member of the European Union, um, given its traditional hostility to the political integration, which is at the heart of the European Union? So the crux of the matter is Britain recognising its need to accept that political dimension, and that must entail uh, no longer having the opt-outs, particularly on the euro and Schengen, and the ultimate objective of ever closer union. Well, it's not just an objective of close, ever closer union, it's a process which is going on within the European Union. The European Union is set up to be an ever closer union. Um, people sometimes talk in this country about uh, airy-fairy ideas of federalism in the United States of Europe. Uh, the European Union is set up with an institutional structure that brings about an ever closer union. And it's been the, the difficulty and the reluctance of, of British pro-Europeans even to accept that, which has often led to a dysfunctionality in, in our membership of the European Union, that we have thought that it was possible by an act of will um, to turn the European Union into something that it wasn't, uh, an intergovernmental trading agre agreement. It, it's, it's much more than that. Um, and, and you can't um, simply wish it away by an act of the will. But is the implication of this that what is required by pro-Europeans in Britain is to convert uh, British public opinion to that ultimate objective of a European destiny for Britain? And so the ideas which are even very widely spread among uh, pro-European campaigners to rejoin opinion in Britain, that one can proceed step by step, that you go to the single market and then it will ultimately lead to acceptance of the notion of having to uh, accept the euro and Schengen and the rest. I mean, that, that approach is, is unsound, that what is required is a sale of the whole idea of a European destiny for Britain. I think if you, you look back on the years leading up to uh, Brexit, uh, I said that um, all the opt-outs and special arrangements for the United Kingdom um, raised eyebrows in, in the rest of the European Union, um, but the, they were also counterproductive in this country because they led to the idea that um, the less we had to do with European integration, the better the terms of our membership. During the, Remain camp during the Remain campaign, the referendum campaign, uh, a lot of people said we had, that the United Kingdom had a particularly favourable set of membership conditions for the European Union. Well, that wasn't really true. Um, it was uh, a partial member of the European Union, um, and you can regard Brexit as being the ultimate opt-out of, of the European Union. Uh, it goes back to before 2016, when the so seeds were sown for an analysis which said uh, it wasn't a good thing for the, Euro for the United Kingdom to be a full-hearted member of the European Union. And, and that is really, in my view, what led to Brexit. So if we are going to be um, back in the European Union, it seems to me that that will only be politically and psychologically saleable uh, on the basis of our accepting the European Union for what it is um, and, and, and joining our destiny to it and, and recognising that we are a part of this European process. In, in some ways, um, there were some people on the Eurosceptic side of the argument who saw this more clearly than the people um, supposedly on the Remain side. Um, there was a, a, a current of opinion on the Eurosceptic side which said, uh, this is about identity. Uh, we don't want to be part of a European identity. And the European Union is a, a, an important way. It's um, founded on the idea that there is and there should be fostered a European identity. Um, and I, I don't think that you can uh, realistically expect to go back into the European Union unless you accept that and proselytize for it. 
Um, one of the things that, that saddens me about the government's claim um, the European Union doesn't want us back um, is that um, this is regarded as a purely static situation. It's not something that, that we can or should do anything about. Um, we simply wait passively against the possibility um, that things will change um, and we'll be able gradually to get back into the European Union through the single cut, through the single market, through customs union. Uh, I'm not sure the European Union would tolerate that. They might well see it as cherry picking. It would turn us into uh, into rule takers rather than rule makers. Um, and I'm afraid it's a it's a, a purely mercantilist view of the European Union. Um, we're in it for what we can get out of it. And I don't think that that is the basis on which rejoin will eventually be possible. But what would it take to persuade the British people of this European identity? What is actually really entailed in that? If you look at the um, expectations, for instance, of, of government and public action, which we have in the United Kingdom, um, they're European expectations. Um, they're not, as some people assert, American expectations. Um, our social and political attitudes are much more akin to those of crossing into Europe than they are to those of, of the United States. Um, it was very significant that during the, um, the uh, uh, referendum campaign, uh, uh, the, those people who wanted uh, a um, uh, written after Brexit, the United Kingdom after Brexit, um, to be a, a Singapore on Thames, to be uh, more along a, a free market American model, um, kept very quiet about their aspirations because they knew that such aspirations um, had no traction with the British public. British public social attitudes are, are very much more akin to those of, of the European Union and its social model than to any other political model anywhere in the world. But the debates which we now have in what is a radically uh, transformed geopolitical situation following the war in Ukraine and the prospect of a Trump presidency and things, the, the 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 pillars of the debate that framed our joining the European Union originally was this idea that we could somehow be a bridge between uh, Europe and America. I mean, that seems to be now under threat. And the other element of, of that, which was the, uh, the aftermath of empire in the form of the Commonwealth, is also um, somewhat problematic. I mean, we have the Commonwealth meeting at the moment um, with claims for... Uh, reparations on slavery and the rest. So we we ha and we have this threat to European security from uh, Russia and China in, on a level unprecedented since the since the Cold War. I mean, it's in this area that we must search for reframing the argument for rejoining the European Union. Presumably, I think the one goes with the other. I, I think the the idea that that we could be a bridge between the European Union and um, uh, and the United States was was always overstated, um, and it, it was, a, if you like, a, a, an attempt to uh, provide a, a new version of the special relationship of of, of the, the Second World War alliance um, of the United States and the United Kingdom standing shoulder to shoulder in, in particularly close amity, um, and and of course um, uh, the, the the idea that. Um, uh, that there is any other alternative home uh, for security policy for the United Kingdom other than Europe um, is, is one which is even more difficult to sustain now um, than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, I, I think the, the identity um, of the European Union and the United Kingdom within it um, will stand on two pillars in, in future, one of which will be to do with security, but the other which will be to do with um, shared values and shared aspirations, shared models of society, if you like. And the contrast with America is likely to increase, particularly if there is a, sub, a Trump presidency. Uh, that would certainly... Um, put an end to, to any thoughts, uh, uh, in spite of what Keir Starmer has been um, uh, publicly uh, hoping um, of, of a special relationship with, with the, 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 the United States. Um, I think that uh, it, it would be pretty far-fetched to imagine such a special relationship uh, under a Harris presidency, um, but it would be um, um, simple moonshine um, to think that such a, a relationship could, could subsist with, with Donald Trump, uh, particularly after the resentment that he's expressed at the idea that Labour staff members will go and, and um, support Harris in the forthcoming election. I mean, it does seem that a Trump presidency could present quite considerable problems for this Labour government. 
Yes, but I, I can't see how they'll have any choice um, but to distance themselves from, from a, a Trump government. Uh, normally, um, uh, well, ev even for Tony Blair, it was within his own party, uh, a politically very difficult choice to make to choose um, George Bush um, rather than um, Schroeder and Chirac. Um, but that that difficulty will, is increased a million times when you look at um, at Trump and and his values and the personality he is, um, and I, I simply can't see that um, Starmer would be able to sell um, a, a close relationship with Trump um, to to hit to his party. But it might. Uh be an argument that has traction within conservative circles or particularly in reform circles. I and mean, it is possible that a Trump presidency would greatly increase the influence of Nigel Farage over the future of the British right, and that we would thereby get a sort of polarization in our politics between a, uh, a pro-American and a pro-European vision. But that, that increase uh, in traction um on the right of British politics would have as a consequence of reducing um, the the right of British politics uh, as a force in our political culture. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the <laughs> even within the Conservative Party, uh, opinion polls suggest that a majority of people support Harris rather than Trump. So I, th I think it would be something the Conservative Party or the right of the British political spectrum would need to be very careful about before going down the road of, uh, of endorsing Trump in the in the event, by no means a certainty, by no means a certainty, but in the possible event um, of, of Trump becoming president. I think that would render the, the right of British politics toxic in a way that, that it's never been um, since the war. But also more broadly, the issue of where we belong and this choice between uh, being close to America and close to, to Europe or, or close to Europe. I and mean, this has been a debate which has been beneath the surface uh, really ever since um, we uh, did cease to be uh, an empire. And um, it's one which we've tried to evade. And in many respects, the story of our relationship with the EU is, has been part of that process of evading where we actually uh, set our destiny. And having this debate exposed is surely quite a dangerous development. Well, it, it, it does have dangers within it. Um, but I think there have been dangers to the stability, to the emotional and political stability of, of our, our, our culture um, uh, by burking this um, debate, by avoiding it. Um, the special relationship um, was, in my view, always a, a cloak or a mask uh, for the feeling of, of regret and bitterness at having lost the empire, at having, if you like, come down in the world. We hadn't come down so far as people said we had because we had this special relationship. Um, this question of, of, of a debate between identities, American and, and European, um, I think was, was more to do with, with British unhappiness, uh, 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 no longer having the identity that we had before or corporately and politically uh, and imperially we had. Um, and I think the, 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 there was no real um, contest between American and, and European identity. It, it was a, a, a pseudo combat um, in order, as you say, um, to avoid facing up to painful truths about Britain's changed and in some ways um, diminished, geostrategically diminished role in the world. What about the Commonwealth in this? I mean, I mentioned earlier, we, we've obviously having the Commonwealth meeting um, going on, which Starmer's attended and been somewhat um, acrimonious in, in some respects. Um, the Commonwealth was always the, the other element in the, this triangle between Europe, America and, and, and our former empire. Um, and in some respects, it's become more important a factor because principally because of the rise of India to a, a major economy. Um, but also the prospect of uh, Nigeria and other Commonwealth members growing very fast. And so there is a sort of an economic dimension to this now, which wasn't there, uh, let's say, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, on the other hand, this has a problematic angle in terms of Britain's internal debate, particularly one which is fired up at the moment on the right by the issue of immigration. I mean, how do you see the, the this Commonwealth element of the idea that post-Brexit we have to 
look elsewhere for our trade relations. And people are particularly talking about uh, some form of special relationship developing with India in, in the commercial field, at least, despite the fact that, that India is not necessarily compatible with a Western strategy based on America. I mean, the, the other thing which is very striking recently was Modi's presence at the BRIC meeting hosted by uh, Mr. Putin. So yeah. where does all this stack up? It doesn't stack up. Uh, and uh, in the same way as uh, America is a, 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 a hypothesis desperately embraced in order to disguise and turn away from what is the British reality of the day. Um, so the Commonwealth is, is a yet more implausible mask and, um, and pretense. Uh, the thought that the, the, the United Kingdom um, can see a, as a large part of its economic and political future, its relationship with India, it, it, it's pure self-delusion. Uh, it, it's even more absurd than the idea that you can't, um, that you can turn your back on Europe, which geographically, politically is there um, uh, and is uh, um, unavoidable. Um, no, I, I, I simply don't take seriously this idea that we're going to replace um, uh, the European links that, that were so important to us for 50 years um, with links with India. None of that prevents having better trade relationships with the with, with India. Um, perhaps there can be a reset of uh, relations with India, and I'd be all in favour of that. Um, but a reset is not what we need with the European Union. We need to rejoin as soon as possible uh, and to turn back the, tr the, the vast problems um, and the disruption which has been caused by Brexit. But what you're really saying is that these issues of identity, the ones which actually framed our original decision to join the EC, uh, this question of where we stand in the world vis-a-vis -vis America, where we stand vis-a-vis -vis our former empire, they're back with a vengeance and may well frame, um, well, we'll have to frame indeed, the debate about how we ultimately come to conclude that our identity is a European one, our destiny is a European one, which, as you said before, is the really the prerequisite of a campaign to rejoin. Yes, uh, America traditionally, although not exclusively, um, has been a, a, an attractive pole of attraction to, to the right of, of British politics. Um, it's it's a, a strange um, somersault that is now being turned um, to claim that the Commonwealth, and particularly what sometimes calls the new Commonwealth, um, could be an alternative pole of attraction to Europe. Uh, I, I, I don't think that um, very many people um, who voted um, to leave the European Union in 2016 um, wanted to replace um, an over-dependence on the European Union with, with an over-dependence on India. I think that would have seemed a, a very strange conclusion to draw from their vote in 2016. But these issues are all coming to the fore. I mean, we see whether Trump wins the presidency or not, but even if he doesn't, uh, the trend in America towards isolationism, particularly in trade, mm -hmm. is well established and is certainly not going to not get to change. It's, if anything, going to intensify. And all the uh, problems that arise about seeking an alternative uh, in Asia, in India, particularly in the building on the former Commonwealth, are equally coming to a head at the moment. I mean, how long will it be possible for the Labour Party to maintain this current position of essentially pretending that uh, Brexit is there and done and there's nothing we can do about it, um, particularly with the economic pressures mounting? I mean, the, the idea that you, they can go on talking about growth without addressing the the issue of uh, raised by Brexit on our on our trade uh, seems incredible. Well, it is incredible, and I, I think um, the, the supposed um, uh, Brexit position at the moment it is an unstable one. Uh, it will always be throwing up new problems, new challenges, new uh, incoherence, and new anomalies. Um, and the Labour Party's approach to it also is incoherent. Uh, People sometimes talk of, about the way in which um, Starmer for quite a long time was in favour of a, a second referendum. He seemed to speak much more favourably about um, the possibility of rejoining the European Union 
than than is his governmental policy or has been his policy for the past couple of, of years. Well, it may be that that uh, intellectual and political flexibility uh, will allow him in a couple of years to do uh, another somersault um, and conclude that the the only way in which he can thread the needle of greater growth um, of of dealing in particular with um, the deficit of public spending, the, the government um, uh, indebtedness, um, is growth through the European Union. And it wouldn't surprise me entirely if in two years' time uh, he did come to that conclusion that there are a vote fast. You remember, of course, that um, President um, Mitterrand started off with uh, 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 rather an anti-European policy, and then he did a 180-degree term. Um, it wouldn't entirely surprise me if something similar were done by by Starmer in a couple of years' time. So the current pessimism in pro-European circles that we're in for a long haul at best um, may actually be misplaced because if one looks at the factors that are building, which we're going to force this onto the agenda again, uh, and the pace at which they are building is very striking. And it could well be that within two years, we have a crisis on, on both fronts, on a geopolitical front and on an economic front that forces this question um, to open again. I think that's possible. I think it, it will be uh, a high price to pay um, in order to get the reversal of Brexit back on the uh, on the political agenda. Um, but, but I think it's possible. And I think when you done something as rash and ill-considered as Brexit, you do expose yourself to all sorts of vulnerabilities uh, from the wider world. Um, you can't um, isolate yourself from the wider world um, once you've taken the, the, the foolish um, decision um, to leap off a cliff um, and, and wait to see what, um, what happens to you when you get to the bottom of the cliff. Um, terrible things can happen to you and you're in a particularly weak situation uh, in, a, in a, a volatile and unpredictable world, which the world has become very much more so since Brexit. Yes, it's strange that the Labour Party has this vast majority, um, but its actual position is extraordinarily fragile. And it is an the, anomaly of the um, of the British political uh, system and particularly of the electoral system. But that fragility feeds into the wider fragility of that Brexit has left us essentially at the mercy of events over which we now have really very little control um, and very little influence. Brendan, many thanks for this um, discussion, and we will continue to pursue the themes uh, in further videos. Thank you.